Yalta, Russia, August 25, 1867. Dear folks, We have been representing the United States all we knew how today. We went to Sebastopol after we got tired of Constantinople. Got your letter there and won at Naples. And there the commandant and the whole town came aboard and were as jolly and sociable as old friends. They said the emperor of Russia was at Yalta, thirty miles or forty away, and urged us to go there with the ship and visit him. Promised us a cordial welcome. They insisted on sending a telegram to the emperor and also a courier overland to announce our coming. But we knew that a great English excursion party and also the Viceroy of Egypt in his splendid yacht had been refused an audience within the last fortnight. So we thought it not safe to try it. They said no difference. The Emperor would hardly visit our ship because that would be a most extraordinary favor and one which he uniformly refuses to accord under any circumstances but he would certainly receive us at his palace. We still declined, but we had to go to Odessa, 250 miles away, and there the governor-general urged us and sent a telegram to the emperor, which we hardly expected to be answered, but it was, and promptly. So we sailed back to Yalta. We all went to the palace at noon today, three miles in carriages and on horses sent by the emperor, and we had a jolly time. Instead of the usual formal audience of fifteen minutes, we stayed four hours and were made a good deal more at home than we could have been in a New York drawing room. The whole tribe turned out to receive our party, Emperor Empress, the oldest daughter, Grand Duchess Marie, a pretty girl of fourteen, a little Grand Duke, her brother, and a platoon of admirals, princes, peers of the empire, etc. And in a little while an aide-de-camp arrived with a request from the Grand Duke Michael, the emperor's brother, that we would visit his palace and breakfast with him. The emperor also invited us on behalf of his absent eldest son and heir, aged twenty-two, to visit his palace and consider it a visit to him. They all talk English, and they were all very neatly but very plainly dressed. You all dress a good deal finer than they were dressed. The emperor and his family threw off all reserve and showed us all over the palace themselves. It is very rich and very elegant, but in no way gaudy. I had been appointed chairman of a committee to draft an address to the emperor on behalf of the passengers, and as I fully expected and as they fully intended, I had to write the address myself. I didn't mind it because I have no modesty and would as soon write to an emperor as to anybody else. But considering that there were five on the committee, I thought they might have contributed one paragraph, among them anyway. They wanted me to read it to him too, but I declined that honor, not because I hadn't cheek enough and some to spare, but because our consul at Odessa was along and also the secretary of our legation at St. Petersburg, and, of course, one of those ought to read it. The emperor accepted the address. It was his business to do it, and so many others have praised it warmly that I begin to imagine it must be a wonderful sort of document, and herewith send you the original draft of it to be put into alcohol and preserved forever, like a curious reptile. They live right well at the Grand Duke Michael's. Their breakfasts are not gorgeous, but very excellent. And if Mike were to say the word, I would go there and breakfast with him tomorrow. Yours affectionately, Samuel. P.S. They had told us it would be polite to invite the Emperor to visit the ship, though he would not be likely to do it, but he didn't give us a chance. He has requested permission to come on board with his family and 
all his relations tomorrow and take a sail in case it is calm weather. I can entertain them. My hand is in now, and if you want any more emperors feeded in style, trot them out. 